Kia ora. Nga mihi nui ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai, haere mai. A uh, very warm welcome to this online seminar uh, from Mindful Money. Uh, we're going to start this evening uh, with a karakia. I'll invite David Rawari Ratu to, uh, to lead us in a karakia. Hey, noi tātou. He tō mātou matu te rangi ki a tau tau ingoa. Te tau mai tau ranga tiratanga ki a mea te tau e pai ai ki runga ki te whenua ki a rite anō ki tō te rangi. O mai ki a mātou ai nei he taroma mātou mo tēnei rā. Nō a mātou hara, e mātou hoki e muri nei o te honge a harana ki a mātou. Au a hoki mātou e kāwea ki whakawai a engari. A ko rangi a mātou te kino nau hoki te ranga tiratanga te kaha me te kororia āke. Ake, ake, amine. Amine. Thank you very much, Rauru. Um, tonight uh, we've got uh, we've got a great seminar ahead of us. So so uh, uh, a very very warm welcome again. Uh, we've got a great panel. I'm really uh, really excited by tonight's event. So um, uh, let me just start off with uh, with saying this is uh, the fifteenth in Mindful Money series of online seminars. We've had some great seminars, so please uh, uh, go and check them out on Mindful Money's website, which is www.mindfulmoney.nz. Uh, and uh, on there, you'll see not only the, uh, the full YouTube video, but you'll also see a transcript of the, uh, 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 of the seminar. So, so uh, uh, Generally, actually, a little bit more of a summary than the transcript, but uh, 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 but it's uh, a really interesting uh, thing to to watch some of the seminars. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about alcohol, and the question posed is: a time for divestment from from alcohol? We have three great panelists uh, joining us. So, uh, first, may I introduce uh, David Rawari Ratu. Uh, David affiliates with uh, Nati uh, Teata Waiahoa, Tainui Nati Maniapoto. He's a company director, a chair of Otara Māori Committee, executive chair of Kokoriki Tamaki Makoro Trust, a Māori warden of over 40 years, a member of the expert panel on alcohol for the Health Coalition of Aotearoa. And uh, he is a tireless campaign against continued unequal harm of alcohol on Māori. So warm welcome, Rauri. Uh, Nikki Jackson uh, has been the director of Alcohol Health Watch since 2017. Uh, she's got an extensive academic and practical experience in, in uh, health promotion and alcohol harm reduction. In 2016, she completed her PhD investigating adolescent alcohol use in New Zealand and won University of Auckland Vice Chancellor's Excellence Award for Best Doctoral Thesis. She's also an honorary academic at the School of Population Health at the University of Auckland. And our third panelist is David Beatty. Uh, David is Principal at Booster Asset Management. Uh, he's been there, he celebrates 20 years this year, and most of that time he's been Chief Executive Office. Uh, previously, he was at Westpac Investment Manager, Management, uh, uh, investing money, uh, and when he's not doing that, uh, he uh, referees senior men's football, so we're not going to be using yellow cards and red cards tonight, uh, but uh, uh, a really warm welcome to all of our panellists and uh, uh, and we'll kick off the seminar. Just a, one thing, uh, we'll, run, we'll run the discussion for about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions. And for all of those of you on Zoom, uh, please use the Zoom chat to put your written comments in Zoom chat, and we'll use those as questions. And similarly, for anyone on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, we're on a number of different sites. Uh, I have my colleague, Toby, who's uh, helping monitor those sites and will pass any questions through to the Zoom chat. So don't wait for the question time. If you think of it, just feel free to, to uh, go straight in and, and ask questions. So we're going to kick off uh, with uh, a question to 
Rawari, which is, um, uh, can you give us a, uh, a snapshot of what, what alcohol um, is harming in, the, in, in Māori communities? What, what, what's the problem here mm -hmm. and what kind of harm is occurring and how is it not being properly regulated? <clears throat> You know, to me, how to Kiakwe e Peri, um, Kiakoto Rawiri, uh, Kiakwe Niki, uh, Karen, uh, Rawako Akuhata, in Akuta. Thank you for the opportunity, David, and greetings to, to the, uh, uh, my colleagues on the panel and to all of you out there on Zoom, Zoom land, Zoom land. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kia ora tata. greetings to you all. Um, trying to, to, to condense 180 years of, alcohol harm on Māori um, is a hard task, is a hard task. But what I can tell you is that since my ancestors, back in the 1800s, they were fighting the same battle that, that we've picked up to this day, that we picked up today. And that is trying to minimize the harm that alcohol is having on my people. Alcohol way back then was used in many, many cases as a weapon against us. Māori would have to, as an example, a very quick example, Māori would have to travel days and days to get to the Māori land court to have their, their, their land claims heard. They arrived with no money. They arrived with no accommodation. But the store owner was a clever fella because what he would do was advance them credit. Once the land court had made their determination in terms of how much Māori was going to get for their land, they had to pay the bill. They didn't have enough money to pay the bill, so what happened was the land was taken. The land was taken. Those were the extremes back then. But what it did in the early stages of Māori society was it broke Māori society as we, as they knew it back then, and as we know it, they broke it apart. So all the processes, the procedures, the the values that Māori had within society back then disappeared, pretty much. And as we go through history, right up into this very day, and, and that's all through alcohol. Alcohol abuse, the availability of alcohol, the availability of alcohol. Uh, and as we, as, we, as we move through the years, right up to 2020, nothing has changed. In fact, it has got worse. It has got worse for my people in that um, alcohol harm is a big problem. Now, nobody, nobody right at this moment, no one can say um, that here, is here are the here's the priority list here's the harm because there isn't any data there there is data out there but it's dated and it's not specific the fact of the matter what i can tell you because i grew up with it i lived with it i slept with it and i saw it every day of my life that alcohol was a huge huge uh evil around the necks of my people I grew up at a time where Māori were not allowed to be served in the hotels. I saw firsthand where Māori was served in what we call a kāuta uh, pāwhara, which was a lean-to outside the hotel. That's where Māori was served, out there. Uh, in my early teen years, I saw, I saw the evils of, of alcohol. Now, before I even go on, I'm not saying this is not about trying to stop people from drinking. You want to drink? Knock yourself out. What I'm saying is that the level of alcohol harm on my people is unjust and unequal. You tell me a situation where uh, I think the figure was 56 or 57 licensed premises, which includes taverns and restaurants and, and bottle stores, 57 or 56 within a 1.5 kilometer radius of Otara shopping center. You tell me, is that just? You tell me, is that fair? And that is what's happening in the poorer areas. We seem to have a proliferation of licensed premises. Now you try a stunt like that down in Mission Bay or in Parnell, you're gonna get railroaded out of there. Liggity split. So in summary, alcohol, alcohol harm uh, and Māori has never ever been addressed. In my opinion, and I've said this openly, 
and often that success of governments and success of ministries of health have been complicit, have been complicit in allowing the harm to continue. As a result of, of, of this and growing up with it and seeing it happen, my own nephews, their children, and I'm seeing it every day of my life, even right up to today, I'm seeing it. The Crown has failed. I've had filed in 2016 a Waitangi uh, treaty, a treaty claim as part of the health inquiry, alleging that the Crown have failed to meet their obligations to, to actively protect Māori from the harms of alcohol. And that's currently before the tribunal and hopefully while I'm still standing upright, that I'll get to before the tribunal but yeah, before, before I, I lay that away with the toes up. What we're saying is that that the 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 in a nutshell that the um law commission's report that came out prior to uh the current uh sale and supply of alcohol act uh being legislated that 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 um it needed to be fair the community needed to have their say but when community objectors including maori object to, to, to license be, licenses being issued, we're seen as a hindrance. We are seen as a hindrance. So how do we address the unequal, unjust um, set of circumstances that, that that's imposed on Māori by alcohol? How do we address that? Give it back to Māori. We now to need to take ownership as a people of what is going on because as I've said, success of governments, success of ministries of health, and to, to, to a point, some NGOs have just collected a whole lot of money and done nothing. So what we're saying is we as Māori, we know how to address the issue. You need to now give the responsibility back to us as Māori. Kia ora tata. Tira koe. Uh, kia ora pai. Thank you very much, Rawari. That's, uh, that's exactly the right place to start our seminar. So, uh, so thank you. Kia ora. Um, Nikki, would you like to to introduce uh, the the context around uh, who is it who's supplying this alcohol and and uh, what's the regulatory system like in New Zealand? Mm. Uh, kia ora tato. Thanks, Barry. Uh, look, if you don't know who Alcohol Health Watch is, we're a small charity in New Zealand funded by the Ministry of Health to provide evidence to reduce inequities in alcohol related harm, including the inequities that David has just clearly articulated. So look, in my few minutes, I'm going to give you a, a quick snapshot of the global harm from alcohol. And why is it that David talks about successive governments, not just in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but internationally, and not doing what they need to do it around alcohol harm. And I'm going to paint the picture. It is the elephant in the room. It is these global alcohol companies that are stalling every measure that we can use to reduce the harm to our people. So look, globally, there's more than 3 million deaths per year from alcohol. That's around one in every 20 deaths. It's about one death every 10 seconds. Um, it's not just death to drinkers. We know that there's more than 200 health conditions that are associated with alcohol. It's, it's by far the greatest burden is in the harm to others. And disproportionately, that harm is experienced by children and women. And in Aotearoa, that is certainly Māori women. Uh, internationally, that, that is the case. It's it's child maltreatment, child neglect, exposure to family harm, gender-based violence, sexual exploitation. Um, it has huge implications for human rights, huge implications for children's rights, huge implications for indigenous, indigenous rights. Alcohol harm will provide, uh, will be an obstacle to achieving the majority of the sustainable development goals and their targets. And as the global alcohol companies have saturated the, the, the high income countries such as New Zealand and Australia and the UK and America, they are increasingly now moving into low and, and middle income countries that have a youthful population that, uh, that uh, don't have a, a history of drinking commercial alcohol, that don't have good natural alcohol policies in place. Mm. And so globally, we're expecting the market to, to grow in China, to grow in India and, and sub-Saharan Africa. And, and so, so who are these global alcohol companies playing such a major role in stalling good evidence-based measures? Now, those measures are, are about increasing the price of alcohol, reducing availability, as, as David has clearly said, and about restricting advertising, marketing, and sponsorship. 
So if we can have the slide, please, on who are these 10 global alcohol companies that, that have the lion's share of, of the market. So AB InBev is a Belgian company. It's by far the largest alcohol company, 50, more than $50 billion in revenue per year. Um, so that's more than the GDP of half the world's countries. So huge power, huge resources to, to fight good policies. Pinot Ricard in France, a lot of wine production, Beam, Suntory, Molson Coors, Curran in Japan, Heineken in the Netherlands, Diageo in the UK, Carlsberg, Asahi. These are the same companies that operate in New Zealand. Um, only 20% of the revenue from alcohol made in New Zealand returns to New Zealand wholly owned companies. So your, your Canterbury draft, your Wakato draft, your spates, they're going back, the profits are going back to Japan. Um, these are, the Lion is our major company in New Zealand. They have the lion's share of the market. That's owned in Japan. DB is owned in the Netherlands. Independent Asahi liquor for our spirits, it comes from Japan. And so these companies, their profits derive heavily from heavy consumption. So in New Zealand, almost half of all alcohol sold is in very heavy drinking occasions. So these global alcohol companies to return their profits to their international shareholders need to maintain heavy patterns of drinking because that's where the majority of revenue comes from. Um, South Africa, Australia, England, a high proportion of their alcohol sold is consumed in heavy drinking occasions. So there's a huge conflict of interest here. They need to maintain high levels of drinking to maintain profits and, and that comes with high levels of harm. So these are the major players um, that are working with governments across the world to delay good policies. And so what we're, and thanks for that, what we're seeing is that um, the alcohol industry now is, has been for a long time, mirroring the, the, the tactics of the tobacco industry. And the economists showed this year that in fact, the alcohol industry has overtaken the tobacco industry in terms of their lobbying spend. And so just like we've excluded tobacco companies from investment funds, we need to be doing the same for alcohol because the alcohol companies, not only are they investing all of these funds and investments in marketing, advertising, sponsorship, which our, our children are exposed to and drives our heavy drinking culture, but they spend a lot of money in PR and lobbying. Um, we've seen that very recently with um, efforts that we've tried to get health warning labels across the line and the extensive lobbying that's occurred. They invest heavily in corporate social responsibility. So these, these um, companies are in our high schools in New Zealand. They're teaching our kids about drinking and about harm. They set up charities. They downplay the risk between alcohol and cancer. And they're heavily involved in um, these suggestions around profit shifting in, in these global alcohol companies. Increasingly, we see this very much in the New Zealand context, but also internationally, is they use the money to put in place legal threats around alcohol policies. So in New Zealand, we have fought and fought and fought to reduce the availability of alcohol. And we've ended up in the high court and after five years, and I think we're now heading to the court of appeal against alcohol companies, particularly the suppliers, to try and affect change. In, in Canada, they tried to put cancer warning labels on bottles and there were threats of litigation. So the industry uses the funds that we're putting through, say, KiwiSaver funds that don't have exclusions and using that money to lobby politicians, to work in partnership with governments, to make sure that they don't have good, strong regulations in place to protect their citizens from alcohol harm. So when we look at the KiwiSaver investments, it's, it's really sad that we see that, that alcohol really isn't high on the list of exclusions, that very few funds exclude alcohol companies. Um, recently in Norway, their largest pension fund chose to divest from alcohol manufacturing and that, that's fantastic. We need more companies to do the same because alcohol cuts across everything we care about, mental health, suicide, family harm, um, physical health, uh, road traffic crashes, everything. And so this is a major um, harm in society. It drives inequities and it reinforces inequities mm. in social mm. standing and health. And so just like we've taken a similar position for tobacco, we need to be taking the same approach for alcohol. And the WHO and other organizations are now starting to, to draw a line in the sand and saying, we can't be seen to be partnering with the alcohol industry because we have different bottom lines. Ours is health and well-being. 
and, and theirs is profit and it has to be people before profit. Thank you very much, Nikki. There's uh, a, a great report uh, that Nikki's authored on, on their website, on Alcohol Health Watch website, uh, uh, about exactly the issue of alcohol and investment and uh, uh, some of the money, uh, some of the analysis came from Mindful Money. And uh, for anyone who wants to know how much alcohol is in your KiwiSaver fund and which companies you're invested in, uh, you can go to Mindful Money's website and have a look on there and and uh, and see exactly which of those companies you're, you're invested in. Um, so let's turn to the investment side. And I guess uh, David, BT can help us through this, but David, if I was kind of thinking about it from the way that most of the financial community looks at it, you'd be rubbing your hands together and say, ah, looks like good growth prospects for the alcohol companies. Maybe we should invest. Uh, can, can you lead us through uh, a view of investment in alcohol? Thank, uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, uh, I assume that, uh, like myself, you're uh, reflecting on some uh, fairly sobering information and uh, commentary from Rafi and Nikki uh, that should uh, give us all cause for some deeper reflection. And, and I think it'd be fair to say that having agreed to participate uh, tonight uh, some uh, days or weeks ago, uh, having to spend a little bit of time just doing some research and getting a bit of a sense of just how big an issue this was um, has opened my eyes uh, even more. Um, so um, as I sort of go through a couple of things I think are interesting, um, when we get into the Q&A, we might have some, some good discussion about what we can do, because I'm sort of feeling on behalf of the funds management industry a little bit ineffective at the moment. It's, it's just a massive challenge. Um, but anyway, um, you know, Booster became meaningfully involved in responsible investing around 10 years ago. Um, we do believe it's important to give investors choices, um, and we therefore do offer a range of socially responsible investment funds that specifically exclude alcohol producers, um, along with uh, eight other controversial industries. We also provide a range of funds which don't specifically apply these exclusions, but which do all incorporate environmental, social and governance issues into the investment approach. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that because I think that's crucial to this uh, discussion. So our FRI, SRI funds have definitely been steadily growing uh, and faster than most of our other funds, particularly since we added a fossil fuels exclusion five years ago. Uh, so we do continue to evolve the exclusions based on ongoing feedback um, that we're getting from our members. But just, just looking at the alcohol sector, it has traditionally, I think, been regarded as more of a personal lifestyle choice issue rather than a societal, moral, or, or legal issue, uh, like we had with military-style semi-automatic weapons um, or human rights or animal cruelty, say. And I think that's a bit of a challenge for all of us uh, and explains why in your survey that you released, um, it currently ranks relatively near the bottom of the list of those exclusion issues that are important to New Zealanders. Um, you know, quite a long way behind some of the other ones like human rights violations. I know we were talking earlier before this meeting that uh, one of the challenges might well be to, instead of it just being an issue by itself, to um, help educate people of the connection between alcohol and human rights and child abuse and to get it elevated up the um, the scale of how people are thinking about it, and it's not just simply a, a personal lifestyle choice. So um, I'll sort of leave that as, as challenge number one. Um, so while, while giving investors a choice of funds that avoid alcohol producers, I think one of the big disadvantages of a negative exclusion approach to uh, SRI is that it's all or nothing um, and just simply aims to remove every single company in the sector in a fairly non-discerning way. But if you look at your survey results again, um, I thought it was particularly interesting and important to note how the response, uh, how the respondents answered another question. So Karen, if you could put that up on the screen. So um, this particular question, uh, although 80% of the uh, respondents indicated that they supported avoiding controversial sectors, if you drill down a little further, you find that only about 26% of Kiwis support the notion of totally avoiding the problematic sectors. That's the black box on the left. 
Uh, so if you add up the next two boxes, around 53% are in favor of a notion more akin to avoiding the worst companies um, and even including more companies in those sectors with higher standards. So from my perspective, just looking at that, uh, the finding provides, I think, particularly useful information for us as it's very consistent with those fund managers who are now taking more of a positive integrated ESG approach to their investing, whereby rather than just excluding all companies, we do actually avoid or underweight the worst companies and then continue potentially to invest in and engage with some of the best companies. I think that's a way for us to um, manage that sort of opening suggestion that perhaps with such great volumes in an industry, it's, it's not a sect you want to be out of completely. And I, I don't think you'd necessarily want to be, but um, if you follow a, a positive ESG approach, you might, for example, support um, a company like Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, who amongst a, a whole range of luxury brand items, uh, manufacture high-end champagne and brandy, which typically is, is mainly for social drinking. Um, whereas you might not support, say, Diageo, which was on Nikki's screen before, who are a UK-based company, the fifth largest manufacturer in the world, and they make their bread and butter by supplying cheap alcohol for making RTDs and Smirnoff vodka, for example. So um, that's how you can apply a, a more discerning approach to looking at those companies that might be doing a better job in this area and clearly avoiding those that are not without just putting in a, a blanket exclusion which is a little bit simplistic and a little bit simple and, and doesn't actually require that much work to be honest. So um, we've been applying this integrated ESG approach across um, all of our funds and it's I think a, potentially a more effective way of supporting what are some very significant required changes in alcohol consumption habits. I think the other thing it does is that it also helps to provide a what I call a solution for the 80% of Kiwis who do drink responsibly but who struggle with this apparent hypocrisy of divesting completely from all alcohol companies while they're still enjoying a glass of wine over their dinner. And for a lot of people, they struggle with that concept. Um, and by the way, interestingly, some of our SRI members um, have clearly made peace with that potential hypocrisy as they've actually asked us how they can get hold of the um, shareholder discount on the New Zealand wineries that we own directly in our non-SRI funds. So some people have got to... Um, have, have worked out how to deal with that. So, so for me, um, one of the most telling statistics is that 50% you know, of all alcohol consumed is consumed in heavy drinking sessions. So um, obviously it's the cheap and plentiful alcohol is the big challenge. Um, but I think finally, just encouragingly, um, more fund managers are increasingly looking to embed this ESG consideration process into their investment decision making. And I'm quietly confident that it will actually soon become standard practice. And it will result, I think, in fund managers becoming far more focused on the big picture trends and the potential impacts of these trends on the companies they invest in. Um, and another, I think, significant benefit of a positive ESG approach is that it forces fund managers like ourselves to engage more with companies, either individually or collectively, and we've seen the, the potential effect of that positively with the uh, social media companies. So um, I think those alcohol manufacturing companies that might tend to hide behind their responsibilities by you know, suggesting it's up to the consumer to drink responsibly, I think they're ultimately going to risk more institutional capital voting with its feet. Thank you, David. And uh, we should recognize the fact that you have been at the forefront of offering people um, a, an option to, to not have alcohol in their portfolios for the last 10 years. And, uh, and you've shown kind of leadership in doing that. So, so that's terrific. And thank you for, for those thoughtful uh, remarks. Um, why don't we move to some questions? Um, and to all of the, those of you out there, please feel free to, to uh, go with questions. Uh, we've got one for you, Rauri, which uh, uh, is kind of, I, I don't quite know how to uh, uh, sort of preface this question, but I'll, I'll just put it to you anyway. Um, do you have any insight as to why alcohol affects uh, Maori more than other cultures? Sure. Um, loss of land, loss of language, loss of culture, 
that connectedness, connectedness uh, we as a people, we, we, we lost all of that and through the loss of the land. And, and, and so, so, so you combine all of those together, we become a lost people. If you look at other indigenous peoples throughout the world who've gone through exactly the same thing, look at what's happening to them. Alcohol harm. They drink themselves into oblivion. Māori drink to bury the pain that they're experiencing. And, you know, people say, well, how can land loss for the generation, how can they, the generation now be affected by the land loss that occurred way back in the, the, the late 1800s or early 1900s? Because we're connected as a people. We're connected as a people. And generation after generation after generation takes on, takes on um, all of that pain. Now, that's that's that 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 whole concept, that notion, is very hard for a non-Maori to understand, and and to try and exp that's the best way I can explain it. But me as a Maori, I feel the pain of my people when I see land. Uh, here in, where, where I live in, in South Auckland, 26,000 acres of land taken and my people murdered as a result of that, I share that pain, even though that happened way back in the early 1900s. So Māori drink to bury the pain. Not only the pain of, of what happened to our ancestors, but the pain of having to live on a day-to-day -day basis, having to put up with no job, the domestic violence that, ex that, that occurs in the home, the, 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 the bad health um, that they're actually experiencing. So we drink, in a lot of cases, we drink to bury the pain. Thank you, Rory. That's a very, very, uh, very powerful answer. And, and uh, you know, as you say, it's by no means specific to, to Māori. It's uh, across so many different indig indigenous mm. cultures who are minorities in, in, in their land. So uh, um, we've got a, a question here uh, for uh, David. Uh, Di, Di Martin from uh, the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education in Canberra. Uh, hi, Di. Thanks very much for, for, for joining us. Mm. Uh, she said the biggest al alcohol divestment issue in Australia is about Woolworths divesting their Endeavour group, which is now slated to happen next year. Uh, what's your view about investing in retailers rather than producers? So often divestment, uh, for, for, for listeners, divestment's usually framed as uh, getting out of alcohol producers, uh, and sometimes there are criteria about getting out of some retailers as well, but the, most of the emphasis is on producers. Um, Dai's raising the fact that, uh, well, actually, Woolworths in Australia is by far the biggest seller and most aggressive anti-regulation force in Australia. So uh, maybe David and, and Nikki, you may want to comment uh, on this as well. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Uh, and this is something that uh, we have uh, spent quite a bit of time debating. Uh, in fact, uh, the the catalyst for us to think about the whole chain in any um, particular industry came about when we divested from fossil fuels uh, five years ago. Um, and we decided then uh, to, uh, interestingly, <laughs> divest ourselves of the big supermarket chains in Australia, along with the uh, extractors, the refiners, the distributors, we, we took the whole value chain um, because we um, realised just how much revenue that Woolworths and were generating from selling petrol to those people who walked out of the supermarket. Uh, so we almost uh, were forced to. So um, I think when it comes to alcohol, we have naturally followed a little bit of an historical legacy of just simply producers. But I think that um, debate uh, needs to be extended. And I think if the issue, as you look further into it, becomes one uh, equally along the, the distribution chain and the availability issue that you know, David's talking about as well. If we can do something there to potentially reflect 
um, a growing concern that they've got just as much responsibility as the underlying manufacturers, then, then we wouldn't hesitate in um, removing uh, those distributors um, and retailers uh, if we felt that their revenue streams were so significant. Uh, ironically, Woolworths divested itself of the petrol retailing, so we were uh, contemplating um, putting them back into the portfolio uh, because they were no longer um, in breach of the fossil fuels exclusion. But um, yeah, they certainly generate a significant amount of revenue. And, and I think the beauty of uh, or one of the things about um, managing money responsibly is that you really are limited if all you're doing is following great big global market indices, um, particularly passively. Uh, you have very little control over what you can and can't do. And I can tell you that the world's index, uh, index creators uh, are not going to be in any hurry to help in this matter. So you cannot rely on an MSCI creating a global index X alcohol, including retailers. So you've got to be active uh, if you're serious about making a difference in the space. Um, and we've pretty much converted our entire SRI portfolio to an actively managed direct portfolio. So we've got total control. So we can decide tomorrow if XYZ retailer uh, needs to be out, we can drop it tomorrow um, and not have to wait 10 years for an index provider to drop it off. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question, Di. And um, if you look at the example in New Zealand, where the councils around the country have tried to put in their own local alcohol policies, policies to restrict availability, it has been the supermarket uh, duopoly that have appealed all but one of those council alcohol policies. And that is why you know, we're still stuck in the high court on this. Um, the suppliers um, play a, the retailers play a major, major role uh, around availability and, and you know, um, strategies around price. And, and Rower, you, uh, you talked about the cluster of, of alcohol outlets around Otara and, and uh, you know, it's obviously not just the problem of people producing the stuff, it's the people who are, who are uh, aggressively selling it. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, again, if, you, if you're just looking specifically at South Auckland, if you look at all of the poorer areas of South Auckland, you'll find an abundance, an abundance of retail outlets. You, you really will. Yeah. So we've got another question for, for, for David Beatty. Um, it's about uh, the ESG approach or, you know, the kind of engagement approach to, to companies around alcohol. Um, David, from, from, you know, if you, if you listen to fund managers, a lot of them talk about this kind of engagement and the ESG investing and say that they are responsible and they're ethical and they engage. What's your experience as a fund manager and commenting on your peers, if you wouldn't mind, in saying, you know, how much of this is real and how much of it isn't? Because, you know, at Mindful Money, we're trying to give people a, a, a sort of a standard to say, these are ethical funds that, that you, can, you can trust. Uh, um, is your experience that there's a fair bit of greenwash out there around funds claiming that they're doing stuff that they're not in terms of engaging on issues like alcohol? I would say as a general comment, um, it's very early days and um, mm. there's a, it's a lot more work that the fund management industry can do. Um, sometimes in New Zealand, we, we feel as though we're a little tiny country um, tucked away down here, which has um, been a great asset to us in the global pandemic, but um, it's sometimes you feel as though you just lock yourself up and you can't do much from where you are. But I think we've demonstrated in, um, uh, in various other matters that you can actually continue to chip away at some of these issues where they're important um, and, and not give up. Um, and eventually you find uh, there are other little voices all around, dotted all around the world as well, and you can collectively make a difference. Um, as far as engagement is concerned, uh, once again, it's very difficult to do that if you've just got a you know, massively broadly diversified portfolio all over the world. Um, and you can only really make a massive difference uh, if you've got a much more concentrated set of companies where you've explicitly, positively looked at 
you know, everything that they're involved with. Um, and we've also found that uh, there are, there's too much difference around the world when you, when you look at buying in ESG research. Uh, you can get two different answers from two you know, different suppliers and you end up trying to work out which way to go. Um, I think it's particularly important from a New Zealand perspective <clears throat> that you build your own set of criteria um, that are important to New Zealanders and, and Kiwis and use that to create your own mechanism for filtering out companies according to your environmental or social criteria and design your own um, rather than just buying something off the shelf. Um, so, But I think there is a lot more work to be done and, and <clears throat> we're really just scratching the surface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're coming towards the end of our seminar, uh, but one thing we've, we've just kind of touched on that I'd like to come back to, uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if you, if you take action on alcohol as an investor, then you're hypocritical if you also like to have an occasional drink, uh, or, you know, if you like a, a glass of wine with your dinner, you shouldn't then think about divesting from, from alcohol. And Nikki, you and I had a conversation around this that I thought was, uh, was really good. And, you know, I, I kind of have my own ideas why, why, uh, why it's not hypocritical to do that, but I thought you put it really, uh, really well. Do you want to just uh, refute that one? Yeah, and, and I think um, David at the beginning uh, talked about this very clearly. We're not aiming to get rid of alcohol. We're aiming to reduce the harm. Right. Um, I, I am a drinker and I have divested from alcohol companies for using mindfulmoney.nz. Um, but this is about shifting the culture. This is about drink New Zealanders and, and globally um, everybody drinking less and, and experiencing the benefits from drinking less. Um, we have our Ministry of Health low risk drinking guidelines. We're encouraging all New Zealanders who drink to stay within those guidelines so they drink at a low risk level. Um, we want to curb the harm from drinking. Mm. We're, we're mm. not going to get rid of it altogether. Mm. Good. I think that's really, uh, really good place to end on. Um, you know, this this panel, uh, I, I think, has uh, been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, ma it makes me think that actually we should we should run this panel for uh, fund managers and. Uh, <laughs> Do it in a way to educate fund managers, and, and thank you, David Beatty, for your for your comment and mm -hmm. saying that actually, you know, hearing Robbery talk about the the harm in a very tangible way and in a culturally kind of relevant way, you know, it it, it suddenly brings it home to people in a in a way that uh, otherwise they don't realise. And and so thank you so much for that, and thank you. Nikki and and thank you very much, David BT. Uh, that was that was a great discussion. I think. Um, um, I want to just uh, 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 tell people that uh, again, you can find out information about alcohol in your portfolios by going to Mindful Money. At the moment, you can look up Kiwi Saver funds, and in a couple of weeks' time, you'll be able to look up any investment fund on uh, on our platform because we're adding manage funds as well. Um, please uh, put uh, put these seminars in your diary, seven o'clock on Wednesdays. We have a seminar next week with uh, somebody called Tom Hartman, and some of you may know him through the media. He works at uh, Sorted. Uh, he's their, basically their education advisor at Sorted and at the Commission for Financial Capability. And He's terrific on, on things you should know uh, as an investor. Um, so it doesn't require a lot of uh, um, knowledge about investment. Uh, uh, Tom's uh, a great explainer of, of good investment practice. He'll be joining us. Hope you come back next week. Uh, all of these seminars, as I said, are on Mindful Money's website, www.mindfulmoney.nz. A uh, thanks to our sponsors, so the... Uh, we've been uh, generously supported uh, by Booster Asset Management, and thanks very much to, to David, um, by Harbour Asset Management, uh, and by Generate. So thanks very much to those uh, sponsors, and thank you all for, for joining us. Ka kite ana. Ka kite. Ka kite.